Welcome to Season 2 of Ship Faced, everybody. Before we continue with this week's material, I wanted to take some time to thank everybody involved. I want to give a special thanks to David, my friend and colleague, who helped develop the title sequence for each of these episodes. I also wanted to thank my friends and family for providing extra insight with me on narrowing down the best format and content style for this channel. Without their input, this channel would look very different. So I want to say thank you. I also want to take some time to thank every one of you, my viewers. Thank you for your love and support for Ship Faced. It really means a lot to me. This is something I've wanted to do for a long time. And now that I'm finally doing it, it's wonderful to see the feedback. So thank you, everybody. And without further ado, Season 2 will be with Lusitania. The story begins in 1838, when Sir Samuel Kennard finally received approval from Her Majesty Queen Victoria to begin the North American and British Steam Packet Company Limited, which he later boiled down to just his last name, Cunard Line. Due to the fact that it was not a guarantee that those who crossed the Atlantic back in those days would survive, it took Samuel Cunard up to five years to receive the Queen's approval. At that point, when he finally did receive it, the company spent a lot of its time and money perfecting the process they had. The picture here shows the evolution of the Cunard liner. In the early days, they implored every aspect of propulsion and demand. Ships back then would commonly be seen with paddle wheels on the sides, sails on the top decks, and propellers down below. It wasn't until Leonard Peskett, seen here, decided to vastly improve what it meant to create a Cunard liner. He would create the largest steamer in the world, topped with four 75-foot tall smokestacks and built with four turbine engines. No engines had ever been as big as they were in a ship before Lusitania. And Cunard Line wanted to experiment with turbines, so they implored a system of two ships, Lusitania and Mauritania. Lusitania to be built in Scotland, and her sister Mauritania to be built in Ireland. Like a weed in a garden, the plans for Lusitania's scale grew as time went on. Originally seen here, she was intended to be a three-funneled liner with only three screws. As plans changed to compete and be the dominant superpower against White Star Line, she grew a fourth funnel and a fourth turbine engine. On June 7, 1906, Lusitania had finally completed most of her construction. The only remaining aspects of her build were the interior fittings and the superstructure. Every naming ceremony, as these are called, for a Cunard liner was a glittering social event. Hundreds upon thousands of onlookers were invited to this special event on this beautiful summer day, and Lady Inverclyde, the wife of the Baron of the city of Clydesdale in Scotland, was invited to be the ship's madrina, or godmother, the woman to name the ship and christen it. The minute she cut the ribbon, and the bottle of Australian champagne crashed against the bow. All the guests erupted into cheering and clapping as the most beautiful ship, and the largest in the world thus far, slid down the slipway and made contact with the water for the first time. Between Lusitania and, and Mauritania, the latter proved to be the faster, though Lusitania was no slouch, making an average 25 knots during her sea trials, she entered her maiden voyage later that summer in glittering affair. You might be asking yourself watching this video if any lessons learned from Titanic had been incorporated into Lusitania's story. The answer to that is not yet. Lusitania was built and launched five years before Titanic sank. She also lasted three years after Titanic sank, so it did affect her, but not yet. What did affect her greatly, though, was World War I. Thank you all for watching Season 2, and tune in next week for the second episode for Lusitania.